Along with the Communist Manifesto and Capital, the other milestone in Marx's career was his leadership of the First International, the International Working Men's Association. Marx's legendary fame today makes it difficult to realize that he was an obscure figure with no substantial following in the early 1860s, that his writings were largely ignored, and that even a man as knowledgeable as John Stuart Mill could live for twenty years in the same city, writing on the same topics, in utter ignorance that someone named Karl Marx even existed. The International Working Men's Association rescued him from that obscurity. As in the earlier case of the Communist League, Marx appeared on the scene just as an existing organization was in process of reorganizing, and seized the opportunity to maneuver his way to control. Initially, Marx was only one of a number of people on a committee charged with drafting a statement of purpose for the International in 1864. He had taken no active part in the organization before, was only belatedly brought into the discussions, and was mentioned last on the list of participants. Yet Marx was able to get the group bogged down in interminable discussions, as a prelude to his coup. As he described it in a letter to Engels, In order to gain time, I proposed that before we edited the preamble, we should discuss the rules. This was done. It was an hour after midnight before the first of the forty rules were agreed to. Creamer said, and this was what I was aiming for, We have nothing to show the committee, which meets on October 25th. We must postpone the meeting to November 1st but the subcommittee can get together on October 27th and attempt to reach a definite conclusion. This was agreed to, and the documents were sent back for my opinion. From here on, it was Marx's show. On a pretext, Marx's own word, I altered the whole preamble, threw out the Declaration de Principe, and finally replaced the forty rules with ten. He then maneuvered some Marxists into key positions in the new organization, and by 1867 was writing to Engels of this powerful machinery in our hands, and of his own influence from behind the scenes. The membership of the International was, however, never predominantly Marxist, and conflicting currents were always at work. Engels only hoped that the next International would become communist, and openly proclaim our principles. Eventually, the commanding figure of the Russian revolutionary anarchist Mikhail Bakunin rose to challenge Marx for control of the International. Their struggle for control ultimately destroyed the organization. Marx managed to get Bakunin expelled and had the headquarters of the International transferred to the United States, where it would be safe from other European revolutionary challenges even though he knew that would also mean its demise as well. It was a rule or ruin tactic that would appear again and again in later communist infiltrations of non-communist organizations. In the decade that remained of his life after the destruction of the International, Marx published little. His financial worries were largely behind him, but illnesses plagued him and his wife. The completion of capital was delayed not only by illness, but also by Marx's side excursions into other subjects, notably the history of Russia, which required him to learn the Russian language. Even Engels did not know that Marx had let the manuscripts of volumes two and three of Capital sit untouched for years while he dallied with other matters. When Engels discovered this after Marx's death, he said that if I had been aware of this, I would not have let him rest day or night until everything had been finished and printed. Engels had been vainly urging Marx since 1845 to finish the projected book on economics. As it was, much of the last two decades of Engels' life were taken up trying to decipher and assemble the manuscripts for the remaining two volumes of Capital. Realizing the monumental task that this involved, and his own advancing age, Engels initiated the young Karl Kautsky into the mysteries of Marx's handwriting, enabling Kautsky to eventually assemble the remaining manuscripts into Theories of Surplus Value, a separate three-volume work originally intended by Marx as the final volume of Capital. Thus, 
a work begun in the middle of the nineteenth century, was not completely published until the end of the first decade of the twentieth century. Marx once observed that all his earnings from capital would not pay for the cigars he smoked while writing it. It took four years to sell one thousand copies, and though translations began to appear with the passing years, Marx remained in his lifetime a little-known figure outside the ranks of revolutionaries. His greatest notoriety came as a defender of the bloody activities of the Paris Commune of 1871. His book on the subject, The Civil War in France, sold far more copies than the Communist Manifesto. Marx relished this public notoriety, though it also included death threats. The Marx family, even after being relieved from dire poverty, had many rocky roads to travel. Marx's wife, a beauty in her youth, found herself with a pockmarked face as a result of illness, in her words, looking more like a kind of rhinoceros which has escaped from a zoo than a member of the Caucasian race. She remained a nervous wreck and irritable with her children as a result of decades of strain, for which her pampered upbringing had not prepared her, while her mother's servant, Helene de Muth, had been a godsend to a young wife unable to take care of children, money, or a household, Lenchen's handling of these responsibilities may also have retarded or prevented Jenny Marx from maturing. Her immaturity was still evident long after she ceased to be young. At age fifty, she realized a lifetime ambition by giving a ball, complete with uniformed servants and hired musicians. Even as a middle-aged woman and the wife of a revolutionary, she had visiting cards printed up identifying herself as Baroness von Westphalen. Nor were these the only vanities in which she and Marx indulged. They continued to give their daughters piano lessons, music, and dancing lessons, even when this sometimes meant not paying the rent. Keeping up appearances was a major item in the Marx's budget throughout their lives. During his worst years of financial desperation, Marx strove mightily and with pained embarrassment to prevent visitors from discovering his poverty, though Engels pointed out how futile and pointless this was, even when this required his wife to take everything that was not actually screwed down to the pawn shop to pay for entertaining them. During one of his worst financial crises, Marx contemplated the most extreme reduction of expenditure, which might include requiring him to move into purely proletarian accommodation, and get rid of the maids. The three Marx daughters all became involved with men unable to support them, two through marriage and one in a common-law relationship. All received money at one time or other from Engels, the eldest to pay overdue rent, the middle daughter repeatedly for a variety of reasons, and the youngest in a large inheritance which she did not live long to enjoy.